single by choice or by death or divorce, people who are experiencing separation in their marriage. But the conversation of marriage is for absolutely everyone. Um, because if you are single by death, divorce, choice, or separation, you need to have a full and robust picture of how God views marriage. Because chances are, uh, you may be married, you may have been married, you might be getting married, you know someone who is married, or you know someone who is getting married. And so this message is for the whole people of the kingdom of God. Amen? And so uh, we've been doing a couple of things on Sunday evenings. Last week, might I just say that Doc Kinzer killed it when he talked about death, divorce, and sex. Like, I didn't even know you could do so well with that many extremes, but it was so fun. He did such a fantastic job. Am I right? It was great. Oh, that was so good. We're going to have to have him do that again at a later time, and just maybe he can do it on a Sunday morning, even though some things may not be appropriate. If you know Doc, you know that that man has zero shame in his life, and so he'll do anything for the advancement of good news. Amen? So I'm thankful for uh, our good shepherds, our good elders that we have. And tonight, uh, Denny Johnson was going to continue uh, our marriage mini-sessions, but we are going to cancel this evening, and we're going to do that next week, May 7th. We want to cancel this evening because, as you saw, we do have some damage to our parking lot, so we're going to take this week to get that taken care of. And so um, we will return any bills that you send to the church for any car repairs. You came to church at your own peril, so let that be known. Again, we want to continue this today. Last week we talked about uh, marriage problems are God problems, that anything that results in the marriage is first and foremost a separation from God, his power and his might and his will and authority. And so today we're going to talk about assume the position, assume the position. And after Doc's talk about sex last week, that's an eerie title to enter into. But this is not about this. This is a family-friendly conversation. And we want to continue with our thoughts about marriage. And this is, again, why I think this is important. I read a book called You and Me Forever by Francis and Lisa Chan. And in the book, he talks about you should want to see your spouse in eternity with Jesus. If you don't want anything else, if you hate, despise each other, and you're looking for opportunities to throttle each other when the other one's not looking, you should at least want this. For this person to see Jesus face to face and to receive the full glory that God is offering them. And so we want this to be our focus. We want this to be our goal. And there's a couple areas. Last week we talked about three myths that we believe about marriage. This week we're going to talk about three more myths that we believe about marriage. And next week we'll talk about, we'll call it the truth about marriage. And we'll have a really honest conversation about how God views marriage, how he views it in the scriptures, and how we should apply it in our 21st century Western culture. Because sometimes Americans do things a little weird. Like spelling the word color, C-O-L-O-R. Every other place in the world spells it with a U or labor, or, help me out, parlor, or the metric system. Yeah, we, are, we just do dear, weird things. So we're going to talk about that in a broad context. Today I would like you to please stand for the public reading of Scripture. We're going to be reading a very, very short verse today, uh, Ephesians 5.21. Ephesians 5.21 reads, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. How about that good old, that's some Catholic style ups and downs. You didn't think you were going to come to church to get your cardio in. Uh, let's respond to God's word in just a moment of prayer. God, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity that we have to come and to hear your word. God, to, to know that it has real application in our lives. God, that it is truth for today. I thank you for those who are able to be with us today. God, I thank you for our continued safety that you've brought us all together. God, I'm thankful for your command over all things. God, the wind and the rain and the storms and over every area of our lives. Would you point to us by the power of the Holy Spirit anywhere where we may be far from Jesus? God, anything that may be hindering our love for one another. God, anything that may be getting in the way of your will and your purpose in our lives. I pray today that you pour through me the gift of preaching. God, that these are your words and not my own. Amen. So, 
we're calling this today Assume the Position, and we have one main idea. It's our big idea that the greatest position of our marriage is one that begins in reverence to Jesus. This is not just in marriage, but this is in every area of our life. Friendships, relationships, working relationships. The greatest position of anything is one that begins in reverence to Jesus. There's a couple things in Scripture that we find about reverence. How many of you are familiar with the concept of the fear of the Lord? Okay, two of you. The fear of the Lord. Opportunity to raise your hand. There you go. Some interaction is good to make sure that you're not asleep. The fear of the Lord. So one way to look at the fear of the Lord is a reverent view. So the same way that you would, you would stand when the judge would enter the room, that would be a, a reverent perspective. But the fear of the Lord just does not have to do with reverence, but it also has to do with this real fear of the overall majesty of God. And so early on in Revelation, we find this picture of people who are so terrified that they'll have to approach God Almighty. Keep in mind that God's radiance alone could kill you. And so people are naturally afraid, and unholy people are naturally afraid of walking into An almighty, majesty-filled God. And so this is what they do. They go and hide in caves early on in Revelation, and they cry out, why don't you just let the rocks crush us instead of us having to stand face-to-face with God Almighty? And so this is the position of our lives. This is the position of our marriages, our relationships, the way that we do our vocation, is that we approach that role, that relationship, that responsibility or that duty with this same reflective atmosphere. That I'm about to enter the presence of a holy God. And what does God remind uh, Moses near the burning bush to go ahead and take your shoes off? Because where you are standing is holy ground. Ephesians or Ephes- uh, Colossians chapter 3 verses 10 says that Christ is all and in all. God's holy presence is over all creation. So whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, do all for the glory of God. Because we're very real, very present in his midst. Um, Today, Randall said, uh, there's always someone watching you. Not just like in a supernatural sense that God is able to oversee everything, but people are looking and watching us. Now, I want to jump back on that. God is always watching us. He's taking into account. He, he's looking at the way that we choose to glorify him and the decisions that we make. And this step is so important. The greatest position of our marriage, our lives, our relationships, our vocation, our work, our hobbies, our duties, our dreams and hopes and aspiration begins in reverence to Jesus. The Westminster Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Your whole goal is to give God glory, to enjoy him, and to make his name famous. That's really your job duties. But it first begins in a reverent posture to God. And so I'm going to talk about some more myths that really get in the way of us living in a reverent posture to to Jesus. And our first myth is my favorite one. My kids are my life. Now this phrase is super popular with single moms or other individuals who know that they have a priority in shepherding their children. But they forget that... Before anything else comes your duty to following Jesus. Now, that often gets in the, in the way of how we make decisions in our life. Now, I want to respond with what Scripture has to say. Will you go to the verse that follows after that, Tanya? It begins in Mark 10, verse 6 through 9. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they are one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one asunder, let no one separate. And so we first go back to this myth of my kids are my life. Now, if we look at the man and woman creation that God brings together, you'll find that the two merge into one. It's like pouring Kool-Aid and sugar together. Eventually, if we stir it long enough, the two will dissolve and will mix. But what we're creating is not a man and woman and child sandwich, where the two are struggling to become one because there's something constantly in the middle. Um, Husband and wife and kids in the middle doesn't sound very appetizing. But you can greater do the things that God wants you to do if you'll just go with this thought, that kids are not the priority in the marriage, 
but they're loved and welcomed in the relationship. Kids are not the priority, but they're loved and welcome into the relationship. I've seen a lot of marriages and relationships destroyed from this one simple fact that they let the kids be the ruling priority within the relationship. Usually it's disagreements about parenting. Usually it's disagreements on maybe different behaviors of the kids, preferences about how to, you know, what does Johnny and Susie want this week? So we're allowing the kids to separate us when God has reminded us that first and foremost, God has created us, male and female, to be one together. God doesn't view us separately as Brandon and Erica, but he views us together as one who represent his Trinitarian image. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Brandon and Erica together, Jesus in the middle. Now, we often forget that picture, and we think about it as me, myself, Erica and herself, and somehow God is somewhere like in the distant reality somewhere around us. But again, this isn't a man and woman sandwich with children in the middle. It's a man and woman God-centered relationship where kids are given as a gift to be raised up in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. Like that is one of the kids are super great gifts. We have a really fun gift who sometimes is ornery, but he really loves life and he's joyful and he eats like a grown man. God gives us great gifts so that we can carry out the mission of making disciples first and foremost in our own home. But we often forget the duty of making disciples and evangelizing our own household for the sake of childbearing and rearing our own children. The suddenly, like, the duties of parenting suddenly get in the way and they have a greater priority of getting the kids to soccer practice, getting them to games on the weekend, getting them to their other school activities, that you've totally taken out the Jesus part of the relationship altogether. Anybody trekking with me? You've seen relationships like that or the families that don't go to church because so-and-so's got a soccer game on Sunday? Uh, there's this cool uh, Christian satire website. It's called the Babylon Bee. If you don't know the Babylon Bee, you've got to find it. It's hilarious. There was this really fun satirical article, and it said, Parents shocked by daughter's lack of belief following quarterly church attendance. <laughs> and it was just a fun little article that... You know, so-and-so were upset because their daughter didn't know if they believed, but they also correspondingly had gone to church two or three times a year. It's a joke. You can laugh. There you go. Uh, Eddie's my cue. Hey, Eddie, could I get an amen up there real quick? It's not, there we go. There we go. Amen. If, uh, if you guys don't do it, I'll get Tanya and Eddie to do it for me. This phrase, my kids are my life, is really unsettling because at its very root, it's idolatry. You are worshiping the gift and not the giver. Again, kids are not the priority, but they're welcome and loved in the relationship. Does that mean that you leave your kids in the parking lot of Walmart on a really hot day in Arkansas? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, absolutely not. God has given you these gifts as an opportunity to steward them toward a loving relationship with Jesus. Now, in those parenting relationships, you are also charged to glorify God with your children. And sometimes as your kids get older, it will get infinitely more difficult because they develop opinions, and then they lie to you, and then they do their own thing. We are... Uh, we are not to, to that stage yet, and I'm going to hold off as long as I can on, because uh, the last thing you want is a two-year-old with an opinion. I'll just wait till they're like 13 so I can enjoy these years to come. He has, though, started to lie. We'll say, Elijah, do you need your diaper changed? He'll go, no. There's a time bomb ticking inside of it, and it's got to be, <laughs> we got to get rid of it. Uh, so, Let's live with this thought that my kids are not my life, but God has called us to be one flesh, and he's called the kids into the relationship to be loved and to be welcomed and to be nurtured and to be discipled. We're going to talk just in a, in a brief minute about a thing that I'll call missional priority, about our role and our duty of stewarding the things that God has given us. So this leads to our second thought. Another myth that we really believe about marriage is this, the myth of homeostasis. We just really like it here. Now, I feel like I have uh, the utmost credibility to speak about this subject because for a long time, this was our life. Um, 
When I became engaged to Erica, I had many dreams of grandeur and goodwill and excitement. And I said, let's move far away. And she said, no, we're going to live a mile away from my parents the whole time. And anyone who's ever lived close to their in-laws, you're like, no. Amen. And so I said, <laughs> that was good. Uh, be careful for those nudges towards the, the ribs. And uh, I said, hey, there's a potential of a job opportunity in Alaska. And she cried. She said, I can't do this. I don't think that we can do this. Can you look for something closer? I said, I'm looking for a ministry job. And so no joke, I applied to over 300 sales jobs. Um, like There was only one hit, and that was to sell insurance in a very like highly like, competitive market where other guys who had been in the industry for 10 to 15 years were trying to provide for their family. And I said, no, no thanks. And so by the grace of God, uh, he opened up a possibility for us. But it first began with this belief of, we really like it here. We really like what's comfortable. We really like our friends, our family, and the area and the tradition that we grew up in. Now, in Wichita, Kansas, I can drive anywhere all over the city and not have to use my GPS. I know where all the major streets are, all the major businesses. I can go any place, anywhere. It was a really comfortable place for us. It was comfortable even more for the fact that uh, grandma was free babysitting. But I couldn't get over this overwhelming, unsettling sense that this isn't the place that God has called us to. And uh, there were a lot of disputes and arguments and difficulties with Eric and I because I said, let's move here. Let's move here. Can we just get up and sell everything and move to Chicago? And uh, that was the ups and downs for her as well. But I think we both got this sense that God was calling us somewhere else, and it was going to require a, us to move out of our comfort zone. And I want to talk about the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go. And make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'll be with you till the end of the age. I'm with you always. Now, in verse 19, the word go is like an active verb, like run, walk, jump, sing, play, dance. Go does not involve us staying in the same exact position, in the same exact place for the duration of our lives. Because I honestly believe that if we pray this prayer, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go and I'll do whatever you want me to do, he'll take us outside of our comfort zone and he'll put us in a position, position in a situation in which we cannot rely on our own skills, our own abilities, but we insanely have to cling on to the grace of God in order to survive. This is where the subject of missional priority comes in. Missional priority says that the mission that God has laid out for us is the most important thing in our lives. The mission of God, evangelizing the whole world, making disciples, is the thing that really shapes the way that we make decisions. Where do we live? What kind of jobs do we have? What are our relationships? Where do we shop and where do we eat? The missional priority or the missional imperative reminds us that we have to move outside of our comfort zone because where God is calling you may not be where you're currently situated. Now, I'm not advising you to like sell everything and ship away and move to Namibia or Kenya or South America to go live in the bush. If God calls you to Southern California, uh, I'm more inclined that's for, to believe that's his divine will for you to be on the beach in 70 degree weather, suffering for the Lord or Destin, Florida, can I get an amen? Here I am, Lord, send me. Colorado, I'm down. Lord, whenever you're ready. Missional priority says that the mission of God is the single most important thing in our lives. And so I'm going to need several volunteers in order to build a big picture. I need five, four, three, one. Five, four, three, one. Five, four, three, one. So if you are, we haven't hit those numbers, so come on up and, and we'll draw a big picture and everyone will be a part of it. I need five people. Cam, George, Kim, Aaron, DJ, come on. I need four more people. Okay, would you five hold hands in a big circle? I need four more people. Justin, you're coming up. Zach, you're coming up. Okay, if you're five, 
Oh, wait, let Zach in. I need Barry. All right, you let them inside. We're going to make a circle within a circle. So we need five people, four people, three people, one person. I need three more people. There you go. Scott, Erica, Patty, Larry. Okay, Larry is going to be the center of everything. <laughs> okay, so I need a circle inside this circle. Okay, so you're going to have to squeeze together. So Larry is going to stand exactly in the middle. If you can't, if you can't find him, just look for his head. Okay, so Larry's in the middle. Now everybody, we need three people around Larry. Yep, three people around Larry. Okay, this worked a lot better on a piece of paper when I drew the circles. Okay, we need four people around them. And we need the five gathering hands. So this is what I mean by missional priority. Everybody has a responsibility. We find our outer circle, the circle of the five, that is the global church. No churches are competing. Every church is working together to make disciples of all nations. The next, where Barry and Lane are together, this is the local church. God's mission is not just global, but it's particular. He has called us to a certain place at a certain time to make disciples. The next thing, the family of three around Larry, that is the marriage and the family. We make decisions based upon what God wants in our lives and how we raise our kids and how we make decisions and where we live. This also means that we raise up our children in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. Larry, who's in the middle, his single call in this life is to be a disciple and a student of Jesus Christ and to make disciples in his own time, in his own space. Now, if you'll notice, these circles cannot exist one without the other because they all fit inside each other. This is the missional priority, that the global church has a mission, the local church has a mission, the family has a mission, and the individual has a a mission. They are not disconnected, but they're all together, and you may unlink and go back to your seats. Would you give them a round of applause? Thank you. That was fun. That was fun because I didn't have to be in the middle of a bunch of warm people. Hats off to Larry because he's probably sweating. So missional priority or missional imperative says that every grouping of people in the world have the same call. And that's to evangelize the world. Acts 1.8 says to go into all the world, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the furthermost regions of the world, the earth. That's what we've been called to. Now, it does not work the world will not hear the good news about Jesus Christ if they're all not working together. Did you know that every other Jesus-professing church in Saline County, and there's like 160 churches, we'll just say that most of them really like Jesus, we're all working together. We're a part of the global church doing local work, reaching people in our neighborhood and people in our city, because I'm just going to be really honest with you. People who go to Centerpoint may not be interested in people who go to Gateway. People who go to Gateway may not be interested in Holland Chapel, Geyer Springs, no, 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 church, 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 any other churches you can think of. And so we have to remind ourselves that the church here is working along with the church in Dallas and in Arkadelphia and in Shannon Hills and in Little Rock and in Fayetteville and in West Philadelphia where I was born and raised and in San Diego. There you go. Just keep making sure you're keeping attention. And so for this mission to work out, everyone must know their priority. The global church works to reach people all across the world. The local church reaches people that God has placed us with in our present context, in our present society. And let me remind you that the local church should look different than every other local church. How Gateway functions is very much different from how Forefront Church in Manhattan, New York functions. Because we're different people. And chances are that if most of you moved to Manhattan, New York, you would die within five days because the traffic would kill you. And the smog, because they don't have trees in Manhattan, New York. <laughs> We've got a lot of fresh air here. And so the inner circle after that is the family unit. One of the big things that have been removed from the local church is the subject of catechesis, catechism. You probably know that within Catholic churches. Catechesis is this really great tool that families are equipped to teach their children the gospel. That is catechesis. 
you know, one of the things that I think the church has really turned into is one big fat babysitting service. It's where we can come, drop our kids off for the only nurturing and admonition in the Lord that they'll receive all week, and then we're not going to touch it until next Sunday. We're not going to touch it until next Sunday. But some of the strongest family units I've ever seen are parents who take the time to pray with their children, to read scripture, to practice memorization of scripture, because they believe that it is their duty to raise little tiny disciples of Jesus who will go tell their friends at school and at daycare and other little programs about how much they love Jesus and what he's done for them. And then last but not least is the individual. Like, there's no way that you can disconnect yourself from making disciples. Like, go. Make disciples. Like, that's not really, like, subject to our own interpretation. I don't really think he meant that. I think he just meant having friendships. No, 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 no. It is to make other followers of Jesus who go on to make other followers of Jesus. If I hired you for an apprentice job of like, let's say I'm a diesel mechanic like Kevin James, and I say, hey, come and I'm going to teach you how to be a diesel mechanic. And if you show up to work and you don't actually learn how to become a diesel mechanic, how long are you going to last in the job? Like, I should, I should have fired you yesterday. The goal is that you'll be a master of your craft, bringing other people underneath you to go and do the same mission. The largest church in the world in Seoul, South Korea, is 850,000 people. They did not grow through advertising. They did not grow through Facebook check-ins. They did not grow through massive evangelism plans, but they grew out of small groups multiplying because everybody in South Korea at that present time when the church began knew that it was their job to share the gospel with other people. 1 Timothy 2.2, that we, have, we teach the good news to faithful and entrusted individuals who will go on to teach others. And so, this church in Seoul, South Korea continues to grow because everyone in that small group knows that as they're discipling, they're supposed to call other people into discipleship-centered relationships. And like, you ever, like, exponential growth? I'd much rather have my money in my bank account multiply exponentially rather than some interest addition. Can I get an amen? So... That is our goal. That is the missional imperative. The whole world is shaped by the mission of God. There is nothing more important in your life than that. That is the single greatest calling to your life. It's not that you can come whenever you want. Don't be a CEO Christian, by the way. Don't be that. Christian and Easter only. Don't be that guy. So, we've just dispelled the fact that we just really like it here. And that's not to say that where God has called you is not a mission field in and of itself. What's that old phrase? Wherever you are, there you, go. there you are, there you go. So utilize the existing relationships in which you have, where you work, where you shop at. I'm a much more advocate for local shopping. Um, I really don't like going to Starbucks. I only go to Starbucks if I'm meeting somebody. Where I'd like to go is Speakeasy Coffee and Bryant because I'm building a relationship with Michael Carpenter, the owner of Speakeasy. And him and I are pouring into those relationships. Because not only is he a really great guy, but I can throw a rock from Speakeasy Coffee Shop to my house. I'm learning to build relationships in the local areas in which I live. My neighbor, Alan, is the most vulgar British man in the history of the world. But him and I have deep, long conversations about life and about work and what it is to be a man in the time that we live in. And we're just now beginning to have conversations about how he was raised in an Anglican environment in England and how that's shaped and formed who he is today. You have opportunities everywhere you go to do the work of an evangelist and to make disciples. Like, you can do it at your work. You can do it your next-door neighbors. You can do it with your kids. So wherever you are, there you go. Continue the work that God has called us to. And let's really dispel that myth that we just really like it here. Because at the front of all this, you're still praying that prayer. God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Because your goal in this life, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And I think there's a lot to be, there's a lot of enjoyment going on in our life. If we'll just do the things that God has called us to do in the ways that he's called us to do them. I think some of the most enjoyment 
in our marriage and in our life recently is because we finally obeyed the call of God to get out of Kansas into a place where there are trees and hills. Did you know that you can see Arkansas from Kansas? <laughs> That's right, you can see everywhere. You can see the ocean, just can't touch it. Our life, our relationships, our marriage begins in reverence to Jesus because we understand that the glory of God is the most important thing in our lives. And if you didn't know it, now you do. And don't be sedentary. Don't live in a constant state of homeostasis. But be excited about the mission that God has placed ahead of you. And know this. You don't do it alone. Like You don't do the work of an evangelist. You don't make disciples on your own. You are guided by the supernatural power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. So God promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us because he lives in us. And he's willing and ready to take over whenever he feels the need or whenever we ask him. So let's live with that function. The third myth that we believe about marriage is this. Why should I serve them? <laughs> because they don't serve me. Uh, at the heart of a loving relationship is mutual service to each other. My friend John Allen, when he first was getting ready to marry his wife, I said, John, how are you going to orchestrate this relationship? He says, I'm going to outserve her every day. And you know what doesn't happen in their marriage and in their relationship? They're not fighting and arguing about who doesn't serve the other one or who, who does more or who does what. But every day it's a competition to outdo the other and acts of love and encouragement and in gifts. And this dude is like way up there high in the lift because he works at a lumber mill and he's an amazing craftsman. So everything that his wife owns is super fancy. Erica, don't get any bright ideas. You don't want me to buy tools because then I'll have two or three fingers. And Why should I serve them? They don't serve me. Let's read a passage out of Galatians 5, verse 13. Galatians 5 is a great chapter, by the way, because it first starts out with freedom in Jesus. We have been called out of a life of sin, and we have been given the gift that our bondage has been broken. And so then we're called to live in a different light. And in Ephesians 5, or excuse me, Galatians 5, 22, we hear about the gifts the gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, what God does for us now that we've been called out of bondage. Now, in my Bible, the little heading says, how to keep in step with the Spirit. This is the thing that God has called us to because we have been freed. He says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do you hear that? And anybody living in bondage, you were called to be free in Jesus. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Just because you've been let free is not an invitation to go do more and more and more and more. Uh, Romans 6.1 says, do, I, do you continue to sin so that grace may abound? He says, of course not. Why would you continue to walk in darkness just so that God can pour out his unending love? You're free, so live as if you're free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. That's a good reminder for us, to serve one another in humility because of love. But what's the first and foremost important love in our life? It's that Jesus has loved us. When we were unlovable and when we could hardly love ourselves, God called us out of a broken area and he healed us and he made us whole. Uh, again, we talked about last week, there's this weird acronym, JOY, Jesus, Others, and Yourself. That's totally wrong. It should be J-Y-O, J-I-O. Jesus, yourself, and others. You understand God's love for you. And out of that understanding, the abundance of his love, you go, my cup runs over. You're looking, you're looking for other cups to pour into because of what Jesus is continually pouring into your life. Serve one another humbly in love. This is a, a, a truth. A marriage that serves one another begins in service to Christ and his mission. A marriage that serves one another begins in service to Christ and his mission. You can't be submissive and loving and service-minded towards your spouse if you're not loving, submissive, and service-minded toward the creator of the universe. Like, let's make the first thing the first thing. 
Submit to the will of God. Submit to the lordship of Jesus in your life. We have to understand this, that it was Jesus who served us first. One of the passages that we read is that we didn't choose God, but God chose us. Last night, Eric and I were talking about um, adoption, the potential of adoption. I've got a family member who is unable to care for her children, and they are six and four years old. I was just a little heartbroken about this whole situation because, first of all, those boys should have never grown up without a father. And second of all, those boys should have never, shouldn't have to live in a lifestyle where they don't know whether or not their mom is coming home. The only thing that they know is that they're, they're being raised by their grandparents. Now, their grandparents are a good gift from God, a true gift. But where I was moved in the feelings of adoption is that it was Jesus who first adopted me. Now, most of you don't know my story. I'm like, actually, I'm actually adopted. I was adopted by my birth father. That's a really long story, and it's a little confusing. Um, but I was neglected, and I was given up as a child. I was taken away by Child Protective Services. And they contacted the guy on, who was listed as the father on the birth certificate, and they said, hey, I got your baby. He says, what baby? <laughs> They're all here with me. He says, looks like you got a child. Can you come take a paternity test? He didn't know. It was a horrible period of his life in which he wasn't proud of, but it came out as a result of it. So he got with my stepmother, and he said, hey, I just found out that I have another child somewhere. What do you want to do? And it was actually her move of adoption that really just melts me away. She says, oh, without a doubt, we're going to go get him. And so the next day, they brought me home. And I, I could just, I can't even tell you, like, how much my life has totally changed because of their humble position of wanting to adopt me. So, I didn't choose them. Sometimes I wish I, they hadn't chose me either. But they chose me. God chooses me. He chooses you. He chooses us. He calls us into relationship. So we have to remember, as we serve our spouse, we don't do it because we chose each other. We do it because Jesus first chose us when we were apart from one another. And now we're together, and now we're one flesh, and now we are living a life that is glorifying to him. And we're learning to adopt each other. And that's hard, because marriage is like, I won't repeat what I said last week, marriage is like two porcupines cuddling. And women are like, wine. They just get better with age, and men are like milk. I shouldn't have to finish that for you. You're not too sure about that? Women are... <laughs> Ooh. I'm going uh, to stop right there, because there's a, there's a hole I'm standing in it. We could go all day. So there's a culmination and ending to this. It's that a marriage is in reverence to God means that it's a marriage that's in submission to him. A marriage that is in reverence to God means that it's a marriage that is in submission to him. And to be in submission to him is to be in compliance with his mission. You can't say that you belong to him and not do the things that he says. It's like... If I said that I worked for Gateway Church, but I didn't do the pastoral work and the pastoral duties. It's like if, you, if Justin worked at Lander's Chevrolet, but he didn't actually sell cars. He just stood out on the lot and looked distracting to people who entered the parking lot. To belong to Jesus means that we live in compliance with his mission. We do the work that he called us to do, knowing that we're not doing it by our own strength, but that we're guided by the supernatural power of God that is in the Holy Spirit. The greatest position of our marriage is one that begins in reverence to Jesus. That is the chief end of your life. That is the chief call to everything. is to give glory to God and to enjoy Him forever. And the coolest thing is that He's called us into relationship with other people. Spouses and children. Friends, relationships, jobs and vocation. 
in which we get to glorify him and serve him with other people. I'm so glad that this is not a solo endeavor because it could be very lonely and very boring. But as each of us, as we call out, God, what is your will? What is your way? What do you want me to do? And give me the strength and the power and the courage to lean into you in every area of my life. That's when the church does its greatest work and that's where things get exciting. And it looks like we are still in flash flood warning and that is my note to pray and we'll invite Denny up to lead us in communion and offering. So let that be our thoughts today. That are you in reverence and submission to Jesus individually with your spouse, with your friendships, with your relationships, and with your vocation? Are you glorifying God with all that you have and all that you do? Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for your good and wonderful gift. God, the many gifts that you've given us, love and life, joy and covenant. You've given us gifts of children, gifts of friendships, relationships. God, work in which we are called to give you glory in. May we be reminded of the single most important thing that you've called us to. That's to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And we tell everybody that we know about him. God, continue to equip us and move us for the sake of your mission and your purpose in our life. And may we earnestly call out to you, Lord, what is your will and what is your way? Lord, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.